Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. This is part of the 1M by 1M program. We are the first and only global virtual accelerator in the world, as you know. And our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in any revenue. And in support of that mission, we do these roundtables, these free mentoring sessions, week after week after week. This is the 485th session. And uh, we started back in 2008, the fall, with an experiment, which then uh, led us to the full 1 million by 1 million program that we launched in 2010. And um, so, you know, we've been doing this for a while now. Um, over 150,000 people have attended these roundtables. So uh, we have quite a bit of experience of uh, touching entrepreneurs and working with entrepreneurs in these safe working sessions on a weekly basis. The event is being recorded. All recordings are on our 1M1M Roundtables channel. The Twitter channel is 1M by 1M, and at Stromana we have two. One is my personal, one is the 1M by 1M channel. You can follow either. We publish a lot of interesting content. And if you're hash uh, live tagging today, use the hashtag 1M1M. Um, this is a roundtable, not a broadcast, so we want you to participate as much as possible. So I will, um, the call-in numbers are on your screen, but I've, I, we're not quite ready for call-in yet. Right now we have scheduled programming, uh, but later I will put the slide back up and you're very welcome to call in. In the meantime, use the public chat as much as you would like to. We are going to begin today's conversation with Parthiv Trivatsan, Head of Platform Companion Ventures. Parthiv, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me on, and it's nice to meet you. So Parthiv, well, tell us a bit about, the, about your background as well as about your firm. Sure, absolutely. Um, I've been involved with entrepreneurship for most of my career. I've been, uh, I've been in, well, I've been working with startups for about 18 years now, um, eight of which I spent uh, as a founder at a learning and development services firm that I grew from scratch to an exit. Um, I, this was back in India. I moved to the U.S. in 2012. Uh, I, I'm now a co-founder at Companion Ventures. Uh, Companion Ventures is a Boston-based venture capital firm that invests in post-seed, pre-series uh, A companies, uh, primarily B2B technology startups. Um, we, we typically invest in companies that are uh, that are just past the seed stage, but not quite at the size of an A round yet, and that's our primary focus. And um, how big is the fund? Uh, we're investing out of a $40 million fund. Uh, and, and and one key aspect that I should mention is is we we have a so what I do specifically at Companion is is I head the Companion Ventures platform team and this is the team of subject matter experts with competencies around sales marketing uh, finance and analytics uh, we're essentially a acting as an operational team for the investments that we make helping them scale up quicker faster more efficiently. Uh, in terms of the our investments, we typically invest in price rounds. These are uh, rounds that are uh, usually around three to five million dollar raises, and and we lead those rounds more often. And uh, geographically, you invest in the U.S. in India. Where do you invest? Um, we've been seeing deals all across North America, because so it's primarily has been here in in North America, and and we also see a few deals in Europe as well. Not India. Not India. And where in the U.S. are you based? We are based out of Boston, um, but again, that's that's our operating base. We are we are I guess as far as the U.S. goes, we are fairly. All over North. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, talk a little bit about within B two B. What is your investment thesis? What do you like to invest in? Where do you have special competence in? So far. Got it. Um, well, I think we categorize uh, our, ourselves uh, as 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 being sector and technology agnostic. Um, we 
we pay more attention to business fundamentals. I think we are more stage specific. So we look for companies that have a strong team, uh, have a sustainable uh, business model, have great distribution dynamics, uh, have strong market uh, tailwind supporting them. Uh, but having said that, we we are uh, we don't we don't invest in B two C or healthcare or life science companies. What about uh, stage? What do you want to see in a company that is trying to raise a three million down uh, three million round that you would be leading? What uh, what do they have to have in place? Awesome. Uh, so. Specifically, what we again, like I said, we we I think the rounds that we invest in have go by different names. It's typically a C plus or a C two, or it's sometimes called a pre series A. Um, so so I think if I had to describe companies that we invest in, we're looking specifically for capital efficient companies that have launched uh, their product and have early evidence of product market fit. In terms of numbers, this this typically translates into companies that have a million to three million dollars in in revenue, um, and are specifically raising the capital uh, to 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 double or triple their revenues in the next 12 to 18 months. Okay, let's um, do a few case studies of companies that you have invested in, and as you describe these, tell us when when did you see them? How did you find them? What did they have that convinced you that you wanted to write the check? What I'm trying to do is get a little bit into your head to see how your firm looks at uh, investments. Sure. Um, in terms of uh, deals that we see, uh, we, we play, I think we fill a vital gap in the venture ecosystem, which is uh, at the uh, right in between a seed round and a series A round. Um, what we, the way we typically work is we have really strong relationships with other venture firms. We have a strong relationship with the A series firms, which uh, have identified companies that are really interesting, but don't quite check their boxes yet as far as investment goes uh, and are tracking them. So that's a, that's a great referral source that we, that we uh, leverage to find great deals. Similarly, we've got a, a very strong network of angel investors and seed investors who have invest, made great investments. Uh, and we look at portfolio companies that are quite right at the stage that we look for. So these are two primary deal sources that we work off of. Um, if I had to give you a specific example, um, our most recent investment has been in a really exciting company called RoadSync. Um, RoadSync is an Atlanta-based uh, uh, startup. Uh, they're, they're in the digital uh, payment platform for, uh, for the transportation industry. Um, we found them, uh, we were really excited about the deal. Uh, we found them uh, uh, through, I mean, they were a referral because we co-invested with based in partners and Hyde Park Venture Partners on the deal. Um, mm -hmm. they, they check all the boxes as far as our investment uh, theses go goes, uh, they have a great product, they have uh, great market traction already, they were solving uh, a problem. Uh, very interestingly is, is they, they, were, they were essentially bringing into the 21st century an industry which hasn't moved forward uh, as, as far as the technology adoption goes. So the, the problem that we're solving was taking a really manual, cumbersome, paper-based transaction uh, aspect and making that uh, completely digital, uh, which was really exciting for us. Um, and, and, and it essentially checked every box that we looked for. So, so they, were, they, they were doing more than a million dollars in revenue. They had really great traction, like I said, um, and, and really good prospects in terms of uh, growth in the next couple of years. And when you say you have an operational team that works on your ventures, in this particular case, what did your operational team do for, uh, for the company? Uh, this is this has been we announced the deal on the first of April, so it's still early days. Uh, but mm -hmm. if I have to talk to you about what we typically do, our, our competency is primarily primarily around go to market. Um, we we act as an extension of the startup itself. So the way we think about this, or the way we approach uh, uh, engagements, is is to identify areas where the team potentially uh, lacks uh, depth or lacks uh, expertise in. Uh, and, and what we do is go down into the team, roll up our sleeves, and actually start doing the work along with them. 
So this could be something as simple as, as help, helping them with introductions, could be something more intensive as doing market research, doing voice of customer studies along with the team, helping them figure out where their product is going, maybe help them identify customer segments, pricing sensitivity of their customers. So any kind of research that would uh, further their growth agenda is what we uh, can engage on. We followed that through with, with helping them uh, leveraging our finance competencies, which is around uh, saying if they are going down a specific path, uh, how does that strat what does that strategy mean in terms of impact on their cash runway, impact on their uh, customer acquisition cost, impact on their customer lifetime value. So essentially help them build out uh, uh, a full 360 degree view on, on the impact of the business based on different strategies that they could pursue. Uh, and, and again, we could also follow this through with helping them staff the functions uh, with, with the right people at the appropriate time. Um, so we don't, I mean, I think very simply put, we, we see ourselves as extension of the team, think of us as, as um, experts that go in and, and are not shy about getting down to work, rolling up our sleeves and, and doing all the hard work that's required uh, and doing everything. We're we are really true, think of us, ourselves as partners uh, to the CEO and the executive team. Let's do another example of another company that you've invested in and, and go through some of the same kind of analysis on, on how did you find them, et cetera. Sure. Um, another interesting uh, company that we've invested in uh, is, is a company called smartwid.io. This is a company which uh, deploys artificial intelligence to, to help um, help the construction industry uh, mitigate risks as far as uh, uh, accidents and incidents go. Um, a, a key thing, so like I said, we're not really specific on the type of role that we could play. We look for gaps that we can essentially fill. Uh, with respect to smart grid, I think what we helped them do was essentially we incubated a team to help them with machine learning. So they deployed artificial intelligence to identify uh, security concerns based on feeds that they could get from, from cameras and from photographs. Um, so we, we incubated a, 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 an image tagging team for them to, to, to help accelerate their uh, uh, AI development. Um, and we, we built out a small team. We did that uh, for, for a little while. And right now, the team is actually a 35-member strong team that they are that helps them build that uh, assets to, to help with further their machine learning and their artificial intelligence deployments. So that's not go-to-market. That's implementation. Like I said, yes. So it's it's the entire spectrum of anything that we could help with. So it it starts with go to market, it moves to operational, and it ends with helping them understand the financial implications as well. So it's, and who pays for this? So uh, these are engagements uh, that we support our portfolio companies with. So if it's from our team, obviously it's just the work that we do as a part of our contribution. And when, uh, and we also recommend partners that they could work with. So those are direct relationships that our portfolio companies might engage with third-party vendors as well. So, but this case study that you provided of uh, of building a very five-member team that I assume the startups paying for it, yeah. They pay for the team, yes. We, we, we don't own the team, they own the team. Yeah, okay, got it. Now, I, um, so I, I, for instance, went help them kind of frame out the process and, and think about how they should be doing this, and then they, had, uh, they, they then went on to hire a team and, and to build around that. Okay. Um, what trends are you see, seeing in, the, in both your portfolio and in your inbound deals right now? We are in, you know, May 2020, in the middle of the COVID crisis. What are you seeing? Well, uh, it, things haven't really changed much in terms of our deal flow. We still continue to see uh, high growth B2B tech startups that have found product market fit have begun to rapidly scale. Um, and are still a year or, uh, or two early for more CDC funds. So that's been a constant. Uh, and that's probably because maybe we have to, we're still, it's still early days uh, as far as the COVID-19 uh, crisis goes. Uh, so that aspect hasn't changed. Um, we also see, I mean, like I said, we see a lot of deals referred by, by, seed, uh, by, by Series A or seed investors. So that's been fairly consistent. 
Um, but as of right now, I think it's too early to tell about the impact of, of COVID-19 on, on our deal flow because we're still, our deal pipeline is still fairly robust and solid. And what trends do you see in general in terms of types of companies? Are there any, um, you know, any highlights of what kinds of companies are we seeing in 2020? Uh, so, so we have a very specific focus and we built our deal flow uh, relationships to, to kind of deliver uh, companies that fit those criteria. So in terms of what we are seeing, it's, it's, it's largely been B2B tech companies that are... That are, that are uh, well, I said that I'm trying to double click down on B2B tech. B2B tech is a pretty broad thing. So it's, uh, it, 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 uh, so it is B2B the, the, the I think it's it's a um, it's a dynamic of what we look for. So we're given that we are fairly industry uh, and sector and technology agnostic. So we see deals from AI to to Bitcoin to blockchain to it's been fa very very broad based, um, and and these have been companies with with ambitious visions and 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 great cutting edge solutions for for large markets as well. So it's not. Do you do cyber security, for example? Sorry. Do you do cybersecurity? Yes, we do. So, so like I said, so so our our criteria is pretty very very broad. We're agnostic, so it's more state specific, and that's where we we see where we can uh, what fits us and where we can add value. Okay. All right. And uh, are you looking for unicorns? What is your your small fund? And I and and where the question is coming from is that. You know, some of the smaller funds are trying to differentiate by um, looking at capital efficient deals that would seek early exits and not necessarily unicorns. So, how do you, how is your firm structured, and and how do you look at your investment thesis in that context? I think that that's a great question, right? Um, I think to a large degree, we've already seen a, a correction in the way how early stage investors are thinking about capital efficiency. Um, uh, and I think it's, it's kind of, uh, it started with a series of disappointing tech IPOs that Wall Street uh, showed that, it's pretty much showed that Wall Street didn't have too much of an appetite for unicorns without a profitable business model inside. Um, the way we think about it, we've always been very, pragmatic in our approach to, to investing in early stage companies. Capital efficiency is a core guiding principle of ours. Um, we do follow on in subsequent rounds. We passed, participated in secondary offerings that later stage CT, uh, we see sometimes inject into their deals. But as far as we go, uh, I think very close to our hearts, very close to our, 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 our thinking all the time is, is a capital efficiency and how capital efficient startups can be. So that is front and center for us. So you're not necessarily trying to play the unicorn game. You are open to early exits and uh, smaller exits. Yes, we are. But again, in, in relative to our size and relative to, relative to our investment size and relative to what, what we are looking for. So just to elaborate a little more on that, um, we're generally investing in, in post money valuations that are between 10 and $20 million. Uh, most of the companies that we are seeing are are already in well past the one to two million dollar ARR uh, range. So the exits that we are looking, so we're looking for successful exits that make a ton of sense uh, in the context of the deals that we've entered into. Uh, we're not. So what, sorry. What is your uh, what is your preferred preferred exit stage? Are we talking hundred million dollar exits, two hundred million dollar exits? Where, what is your, what is the point at which you're trying to look for exit? Uh, we're not specifically at a, we're not specifically looking for an exit. We're not artificially trying to inject an exit. I think that's something which, uh, which the market dictates more than anything else. Um, obviously, just as any other venture capital firm, we have, uh, we have to tell, we, we are looking at IRR and we're looking at a, the multiple on invested capital as, as key performance metrics for us. So I think anything that that helps us deliver on those key key metrics that we hold ourselves accountable to is what we'd look for. So if it is a really early exit when when it makes sense, uh, I don't think we can we can generalize and say it's a, it's a dollar figure. 
I think it's very contextual based on the investment that we've made, the prospects the company has, the growth that it's been showing, what potential it has in the future. So maybe it's 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 a much smaller exit, less than $100 million in, in, in some cases. Maybe it's, it's, it's an exit in the $50 million range, or maybe it's an exit in the $1 billion range as well. So, so I think that's a little difficult to characterize. Uh, but I would say it's it's situational. It's very specific to the type of investment that we've made and and the prospects of that company. So um, last question actually on this: um, some of the smaller funds are exiting into larger funds because there's there's quite a few lar very large funds right now um, who are willing to play that game. Is that something you are seeing? Uh, not. Well, given my limited view on, on the piece, I haven't encountered too much of that uh, at this point. Um, my partners might have seen some of these, but I, from my perspective, I think it, it's not something that I'm not, I'm, I've seen or I've, I've been very familiar with at this point. Oh. All right. Is there anything else about your work that I should have asked you that I didn't that you would like to highlight? Um, well, I'd love to talk a lot more about all our portfolio companies, but uh, but I think I think you've covered a lot of ground. Like I, I hope, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm more I'm curious, and I'm hope that whatever I said uh, provides your audience with with the insights or or the the ask the angles and aspects that they were looking for. So I'm, I'm I'd love to know if there was something else that you think I could talk more about, which might be helpful for your audience. Well, you know, this is the beginning of a relationship. What we uh, what we do when we bring investors that we haven't worked with before on to this series is, is basically just start the process of getting to know you. And and uh, you know, as as deals come up, we will have a chance to interact and uh, awesome. and you know learn more about your work. Awesome. Thank so, you for sharing. So if I could say, if I could just add to that, I think one one thing I didn't mention is uh, one one aspect which we, which is another deal flow uh, deal flow opportunity that we uh, that we try to uh, leverage, is that my platform team I keep about 20% of my platform team's time dedicated to companies without outside of portfolio. Uh, so oh. these sometimes are companies which are, uh, and this takes different forms. Sometimes this is a mentoring relationship to help help a really early stage company where we think it's interesting and has prospects. Um, it could be a company which is which is which is not quite at our stage, but is one stage removed in the hope that uh, we are on their radar. We get some kind of a working relationship with them to understand them more. Um, okay. so I'll talk a bit about that as well. Uh, so I'm happy to to. To, to review if you have interesting companies or companies that might benefit some kind of mentoring, we're more than happy to, to help collaborate and provide something there. All right. Sounds good. I will definitely keep that in mind. Thank you for coming, Parthiva. I hear that you're getting on a plane. Is that a uh, is that the first no. time you're doing that? In, 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 in on a plane. Yeah. Uh, we, we do have a, a series of, of workshops that we've scheduled for the next two weeks, uh, remote workshops. Uh, and I have one getting starting off in and actually in a quarter of an hour. So that that's the oh. thing. That okay, good. <laughs> I was a bit concerned about getting yeah, on exactly. plane. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, stay safe, and uh, we will keep in touch. Sounds good. Thanks so much, and and you stay stay safe as well. Folks, we're going to switch to the entrepreneur pitch session. Um, just to set expectations for those of you who are pitching today as well as those who will be pitching in upcoming sessions, this is a safe working session. We are on your side. So please uh, focus on just sharing what is it that you need help with, what do we need to discuss, help you with, and we will just get working. That's the simple way to look at it. If you disagree with my feedback, that's fine too. To your venture, you'll do what you like. Um, you know, uh, that is your prerogative. Just remember one thing, not all businesses can raise money, and raising money doesn't necessarily guarantee success either. Sulav Singh from Champaign, Illinois. Uh, yes, Sulav, how are you? Yes, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, so my name is Sulav Singh. I'm a co-founder for Vitus, and we're a tech-enabled financing solution for emerging markets. Uh, next slide, please. So what's the problem that we're trying to solve? 
Well, now globally, there's a $4 trillion credit gap for SMEs. And SMEs are seen as the backbone of a country's economy. Uh, they often employ many people in local communities. So the problem is if SMEs don't have access to working capital, they can't grow in local communities and economies suffer. And we're actually seeing that in Nigeria. Uh, the underlying issue in Nigeria is the lack of a centralized structure to assess consumer credit history. Because of that, banks um, are not able to assess risk, and so they don't give out loans. Uh, and we see that in the numbers. The loan to deposit ratio in Nigeria is between 40 to 60 percent. Credit to GDP is about 14 percent when the world average is 130. So what we're doing is we're trying to tackle this issue so that we can help the growth. Next slide, please. So the total addressable market in Nigeria, the lending market, is $35 billion. And initially, uh, Vitus is focused in healthcare, logistics, and personal auto loans. So that's just in the beginning because we're industry agnostic and we plan to expand once we get the foundation of our algorithm set. Next slide, please. So how do we uh, differ from our competition? So you have companies like Migo and Lydia, and they're offering, uh, they underwrite loans as well. They disperse loans. Lydia also provides data analytics only for their customers. And Migo is trying to provide consumer credit reports to corporations like MTN to help them with their channel finance. We're actually the only company that's providing an end-to-end -end solution that meets all of uh, the market's needs. Next slide, please. So how are we doing this? Well, first, we also have a proprietary machine learning algorithm that's automating the underwriting process. But we also have APIs that are plugging into partnership databases to uh, validate data. And then we're also using the APIs to aggregate uh, data from multiple sources so we can create a more comprehensive consumer report. And in parallel to this, we're creating a marketplace that's in essentially connecting lenders and lendees and providing transparency so we don't actually see lending institutions as a competitor, but rather as a partner. And that's a big uh, differentiating point for us. Next slide, please. So what is this marketplace? Well, so essentially you can come onto our platform as a lending institution and you can search based on your parameters for a specific type of lendee. And then we do the data and decision analytics as well as the risk assessment. And we'll provide you that so you can um, provide a loan offer and focus just on loan disbursement. And then a person who needs a loan, an SME, can also come on our platform, upload their information, and similarly be connected with lending institutions that are willing to give them money. Next slide, please. So this is the product workflow. Essentially, as a customer, you'll come onto our pl uh, platform and register. You'll upload the necessary information, and then Vitus in the back end will create uh, a consumer profile as well as a risk assessment profile. We'll share, we'll share that internally and with other lending institutions. Uh, then the customer will be given a lot of product offerings. They'll select the one that's the most appropriate for them. The loan will be dispersed and then they can grow their business and they can repeat this cycle as much as is needed. Next slide, please. So this is our roadmap. Uh, so far, we're ahead of schedule, and we also have another twenty-five or two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars in the pipeline that we want to disperse uh, before the end of twenty twenty. Next slide, please. So this is a bit about our attraction. So we have a healthcare partnership where we're giving loans to one of our healthcare providers' uh, customers, and we're getting a lot of high quality data, and we've reduced the risk um, of our loans. Similarly, we have a partnership with the logistics. Uh, company and we're giving a, we're giving them a loan directly, but we're getting a lot of high quality data on their end consumers. And then we've also trialed uh, a direct healthcare customer because we wanted to understand how the algorithm would work for a direct consumer. Uh, in April, we also finished the MVP of our tech platform, and in the pipeline, we have uh, a legit or a lending institution partnership and an auto loan partnership that we are planning on dispersing about two hundred fifty thousand dollars before the end of twenty twenty. And we, are, we were planning on expanding the logistics uh, partnership by another 750000 But with the COVID pandemic, we've temporarily put that on hold. Um, and so far, with all of our loans, we have zero defaults and 100% on-time payments, even though it's a small sample size. Uh, next slide, please. So can you stay here okay. for a second? Um, sure. It sounds like you have identified some lending institutions who, who are willing to lend money to uh, Nigerian SMBs. 
uh, and where are these institutions from? Oh, so the lend oh, so all of these customers and even the partnerships are all within Nigeria right now. I see. So you so you have you're working basically with Nigerian financial institutions who want to lend to SMEs. Correct. Oh, and if I didn't uh, mention this, so we're a, we're a C corporation in Delaware, but we have an LLC in Nigeria. So like all the operations are done locally uh, in Lagos. And and you are not based in Lagos. No, no, I'm I'm based in Lagos as well. So I mean, right now I'm actually in India, oh. but I'm originally from like the Illinois area. I see. And why did you choose to work in Nigeria? It was actually, it was kind of random. So I was doing management consulting for a while. And um, one of my clients uh, recommended me to work with Rocket Internet in Singapore. So that was my first mm -hmm. taste of actually uh, working at a startup. Um, that startup, uh, it was a great experience, but it wasn't like the right cultural fit for me. And then so I started reaching out to my community or my network, and I found a great healthcare tech startup in Nigeria that um, they needed a co-founder for, like from an operations perspective. So at the time, because I'm not married or anything, I was able to make that jump. Um, and I thought it would be an exciting opportunity to at least learn from, even if, even if it wasn't a great fit. And I really mm -hmm. enjoyed the work. But during that time, I consistently saw this lending issue across the board. Um, and that's when, after we got them to Series A, I thought it would be great um, if they could do this, but they didn't have the resources for it or the capacity at the time. So I thought it would be best if I started it. And so a, a little over a year ago, um, I started this thing. Okay. And your expectation is that you're going to get pre-seed financing to get this thing going? Well, so we already have about 350000 in funding. Um, so we have revenue, we have traction, we have over a million dollars in the pipeline just from the loan component. So we're already generating revenue. Um, and what is so your revenue thought, model? So, well, I mean, so in the beginning, the revenue model is specifically from the loan business. We're charging two to, well, we're charging two to four and a half percent interest per month on our loans. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and so that's more kind of to test out our algorithm to show how accurate it is. But in the long run, our, our model is more to provide data analytics um, as a service. So we want to, we're, we're going to adopt more of the FICO business model. Um, and lending is, the lending more is to essentially put our money where our mouth is. I don't think folks are going to trust our um, risk assessment profile till we can prove, hey, listen, we have like zero or very low NPLs, 100% uh, on time payments, so on and so forth. So that's what we're doing right now. Um, within so, uh, you know, one, one input that I would give you is um, if you're trying to raise money, you should be clear about what business you're raising money for. Um, if you are, if you raise money and then lend that money out, that's a different way to spend that money versus if you're raising the business to build the credit scoring and, and analytics business. Um, these are very two very very different businesses. So yeah. if I were you, I would kind of be very very clear because you know I wasn't clear on what you were doing right so far, and I would be very very clear about what. Um, what is it, the business that you're raising money from for? I mean, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I think we mentioned that we have, we're trying to do 560,000 from an, like to build out the product development. And then we want 2 million for debt from debt financing for the balance sheet. Um, so to try to just let folks know um, how we're going to split the money up. And what is your question? What brings you here? Oh, so, I mean, so my thought is I'm relatively new to, um, I haven't actually, this is the first business I've started on my own. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wanted to kind of talk about the best practices on how to approach fundraising, um, uh, the best way to network, and kind of just in general, the suggestions on how to grow the business um, from a business perspective. So the first thing that I see is that this is what you presented is not an investor pitch. You're going to need to turn this into an investor pitch that an investor can evaluate this business on the basis of. And there are some very clear criteria of how to build an investor pitch. That's one of the things that is missing in, in where you, what you have presented here. Um, before you go to investors, you should, you know, have that that in, in place. and and. 
in that context, there's a question that I saw coming through in the public chat. Thomas Ahn was asking the question, shouldn't startups start building relationships with investors sooner rather than later? I actually happen to believe that absolutely not is the answer to that question. Because if you go to investors too soon without doing what you need, you, make, you don't make a good first impression. And investors don't, you give, don't give you that many meetings. Um, so if you blow your cartridges early without having your, you know, all the ducks lined up and all the collaterals that you need to have a real meaningful com uh, conversation with investors, you end up wasting these cartridges that you can't really afford to waste. So, so love, I think the first, first feedback for me is try to build the proper investor pitch before going out and talking to investors. Okay. All right. Um, and then I guess the last thing I would want to ask is from a, from a attraction and a revenue standpoint, um, what would be like in your impression, if you were an investor, what would you be looking for to, to potentially invest in an emerging market? Like what would be attractive? You would need to validate the business model that you're building, right? That's why I asked you, what is the business that you're building here? Are you building a, um, decision analytics kind of business, in which case that has its own business model. If you're building a lending services business, that you're, then you're building a different business. Whichever business you're building, you have to validate that business. You have to show the metrics of that business, the assumptions of that business, traction around that business. And that's how uh, investors will determine whether you can build that business or not. So I, you know, the thing that you should go do right now if you're building an decision support and analytics business is go get a bunch of lending institutions on your platform and start having them pay for your decision support and analytics product service. That validation is what determines whether investors are going to invest or not. Appreciate that. Okay. Yep, thank you so much. We can talk more and um, let me finish the other presentations. There will be more Q&A time at the end of the program. Okay, Mike Galba, is Mike Galba here? No? All right, well, in that case, we are going to Joe, Joe Clark. Joe, please unmute your line and tell us what you're doing. Hi there, thanks for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you fine. Great. Well, um, my name is Joe, and I'm the founder and CEO of Now.com. Now is a reinvention of shopping using deep technology to, um, from a, a macro standpoint, create more efficiency, less drag, less expenses, less waste pollution, um, lower return rates, and improve the profitability of online shopping. <clears throat> So our um, next slide, please. Oh, this looks to be uh, part of the first slide. That's okay. Um, so about uh, one of the reasons I started now was about 86% of all shopping transactions online and off are executed by women. And yet most of all purchases are actually, um, as, as they are engineered from the software and process and flow standpoint online have been engineered and created and are being currently run by men. And that's fine, except for that there are many gaps that can be filled. And um, so that's kind of where now was the genesis of now what was created. So some of those gaps are the following. There's too many steps in transactional um, online and mobile. Um, there's too much, too many apps being requested to download to your phone. The return rates offline are 12%. Online, they're 30 to 50%. Given that last year, only 16% of all retail transactions were even online yet, according to Digital Commerce 360. The fact is, if we continue along this way, it's going to be unsustainable in a variety of different ways. And I'll give you an example in New York. We're delivering 15 million packages per day. 30 to 50 percent of those are being returned. This is unsustainable from all different standpoints. 
the checkouts are too long. Google search is mostly ad-based. It's hard and difficult to find the things that you're trying to find. Um, you can't, uh, oh, there's an oligopoly, as we know, and in fact, with Amazon, you can call it more of a monopoly. Um, the piracy and fake products and reviews are rampant. For example, Amazon, which comprises more than 50% of all e-commerce transactions, has about a 30% fake product rate. Many of those products have been de-engineered and are harmful. And the reviews are fake as well. And it can't, um, by design, the model can't really be changed because there's no way Amazon can vet their 2 million retailers. And also, we're seeing micro influences non existent, whereas the Kim Kardashians in the world get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to influence, and that creates a whole other industry with agencies. And then those mega influencers are too promotional. Next slide. With brands, there are problems as well. For example, they've lost distribution in the retail stores dramatically. I've been seeing over 7,000 stores in 2018, I think, um, 2019, and this year, up to 20,000 retail stores, are, brick stores, are expected to close. The margins are, are too thin because everyone's taking a piece of pie. Um, as we discussed with high return rates, there's incredibly high shipping and return costs. Um, the cost of the, the staff you need for the reversal of the logistics. Um, then there's Spamga. They own, uh, um, of course, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, um, Apple, and these people are, are consistently owning all the data, and in the case of Amazon, they're misappropriating it, and we'll get into that later. Um, there's the internal fraud, arbitrage that pushes up prices, um, we already discussed the piracy and things, and also um, what Amazon is doing more lately, lately that actually brought in federal scrutiny of a uh, lawsuit was just filed against them, is that they're stealing all the data of these hot sellers and they're creating their own proprietary products using that data, and they're, they're focusing marketing efforts on their own platform. They're ranking their products first, and they're targeting those ads to customers of other people whose data they stole. Um, also, there's influencer costs, a lost connection with the consumer. Of course, there's a high cost of tech modernization for individual brands that they can't necessarily afford, especially now post COVID. Um, they don't know what their ROI is on ads, and there's too many intermediaries, meaning Amazon, stores, Google, everyone keeping a piece of time. Next slide. Um, and so the steps where now comes in is to close all of these gaps. And it's a simple model, but of course, somewhat difficult because it has to be re engineered from the ground up. And that is working directly with brands to make exact items identifiable through deep tech like computer vision and um, using AI. Um, also, an instant pulling up of a page. For checkout, so you see someone somewhere, anywhere, and you hold up your phone, you can identify the actual product and instantly purchase it without an app. Joe, yeah. Joe, can I stop you for a second? Sure. Uh, you've been going on for a while, and I have no idea what you're doing. So let me, I don't know about the other people listening, so let's try to get into um, a bit more of a Q&A mode so that you can start explaining what is it that you're doing. Is this a store? Are you doing a store? We're do, it's a two, um, there's two aspects of the business. Number one, a consumer app, it's a virtual agnostic shopping cart. So it is trained to identify any product and allow it to be instantly purchased. So it's an app that is sitting on top of various different stores and going and, and finding the items from different stores and, and, and can complete the transaction on your app? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And what, uh, what is the business model? Is it then an affiliate kind of business model? Well, so the second aspect for the, the business model for the app is a 10 to 15% of the transaction. 
And then we also, and the reason why it's so much is we are a value added. For example, we identify the influencer. So if I see you at Starbucks and I like your jacket and it's you know, Ralph Lauren, I instantly can buy that jacket, but we actually pay you as the advertiser. So we identify the person where we saw the product and that person also gets so, but what's what's that? But answer my question. What is, is your business model? Uh, an affiliate business model? You get a percentage of the transaction that you finish on your um, app. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so simply put, you are trying to add value through this app of kind of like a shopping engine, basically meta shopping engine. Yeah. And what do you have right now? What's what's in place? Well, today, um, I will tell you, we're much more early stage. And um, I saw your background and was very inspired to um, just get in the ecosphere. But given your comment earlier, why get in the, you know, have a discussion when it's too early? And I see now that it's probably too early for us to be having this discussion. But I am a serial entrepreneur. I do have experience. I've raised capital in, in the past and executed well. In terms of this particular company, um, we're a pure startup. So I'm actually looking for a technical co-founder and um, you know, who can help me create the MVP. I do have contacts that we can use for testing. And I have some A-level advisors, like the chairman and the president of Macy's.com, who's just recently retired. Um, and so, and as vice president from CBC, we were totally retired. Um, so I've got contacts, but I think at the same time, what I'm looking, where I'm having some um, struggles and where I would love to have some advice is um, trying to find this deep technical talent. Um, and when you're not in a city like Silicon Valley or Austin, Texas, or whatever. So um, let me address what you said. For us, nothing is too early stage. Okay. This is not an investor discussion. We are not, you know, I'm looking at your business more as an advisor, not as an investor. Okay. So the, the feedback that I get that I gave to love earlier is that if he wants to take the pitch that he did here to investors, that pitch is not adequate. So, if I were to introduce you to investors, I would need to work with you first and get you to a point where your pitch and your, your, you know, your situation is quote unquote fundable. Without that, we, we work with a large uh, network of investors, but we don't invest, we don't introduce our entrepreneurs straight into that investor network without doing the work before to get them ready. So that's the clarification on your you are not too early for us. Everybody is, I mean, even if you're on napkin level, just thinking about things, you can start working with one million by one million. There's no problem. But, um, but if you're trying to raise money, that has a whole different set of expectations and, and, and so on and so forth. So on your question about technical co-founders, that's not what we do. We are not a recruiting agency. So that's not our value proposition at all. So, okay. Uh, do you want to ask more questions, is that, or should I? No, I, this is an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, so, you know, I I don't have an agenda. I I'm here to help you with with whatever that it is that you are uh, you need help with, and I to the extent that it's within our scope. Well, um, what I um, what I can share with you is that I've. Um, I, I've been able to do well in the past in terms of entrepreneurial ventures, raising capital. I raised $4.5 million on a business plan when I was um, not long out of grad school. I went to work for an investment bank, and the principals of the firm funded my startup. Um, and then we built up to 100 employees and started one of the first e commerce websites online. And then we launched one of the first B2B marketplaces online back in. 2000. Okay. Um, 
we did not get the exit we hoped, but we did, you know, obviously I learned a kind of travel on that. We raised 40 okay. million in, in our course. Series A. Um, so we raised 40 million in our Series A. But what, um, so I've been able to execute, I obviously have the vision, I've been doing them multiple projects since then, since some of which have been great success. Um, and so what I'm seeing now, um, and I, I might take a moment to address, is just a gap for, particularly for women non-tech founders. Um, when I went to a pitch recently, and about 80% of the people here in Houston, Texas, where I am, were looking for technical co-founders. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I'm seeing with women is um, there were some brilliant people, very qualified, making these pitches, people who have executed well, whether professionally or in other startups, and yet they couldn't get their, their concept off the ground because they didn't have the tech. And now everything is very tech heavy as we move forward. Yeah, the problem that you are choosing to address is going to require heavy duty technical expertise. So I don't think you can do this venture without a solid technical co-founder. So you almost, it's, it's imperative that you find a technical co-founder, otherwise you wouldn't be able to do this business. Right. So that's, so, uh, I think as, a, as somebody who, I guess I would just close and then turn it over to the next company um, and by saying that um, I think a lot more great companies would get funded and would, would um, if they, would, would reach these milestones, they would, they would reach their product market fit and some of the important metrics that we have to reach in order to be funding, you know, advance through the funding as well. Um, I think that that would happen more quickly if um, I can see myself, even, even as an experienced entrepreneur, simply not having access to the technical talent and teaching. And, um, you know, either I need to raise capital to hire someone and post a job description that's not going to work. I Nobody know. is going to fund a venture like this without uh, the technical person on board. I agree. I mean, that's exactly what my point is. My point yeah. is that um, women uh, founders, who most women are not coders, and that's kind of one of the um, experience we're having. No, it's not true just about women. It's all non-technical co-founders. Non-technical founders have this issue that if they are taking on a problem that is highly technical without a technical co-founder, they don't succeed in bringing that business to bear because, you know, you, it's a requirement to do something highly technical. You need somebody who knows how to do that. So, uh, so what you're pointing out is correct that there's the non-technical founders across the board don't succeed because of this reason. That's a fact. That is absolutely an accurate observation. Thanks so much for the opportunity. All right. Well, I hope you find somebody. Look in your own network. Look in the people you work with. Look in the, you know, look in places where you've been, you know, work-wise and and so forth. Maybe school-wise, where there are technical, because I, I'm very, very uncomfortable with random uh, people coming together to do a venture. Being a co-founder is an intense experience. So generally, I would not take as a co-founder somebody whom I've never worked with before. Yeah. So. All right. Good luck, Joe. Thank we're going to Rajesh. Rajesh, could you please uh, unmute your line and tell us what yes. you're working on? Uh, Go on. Uh, good evening. I am in India right now, so it's an evening for me. Good evening, sir. Uh, Samana. Um, so basically, we are an e commerce marketplace uh, mm -hmm. in the business of uh, selling spiritual and yoga products for last 15 years or so. Uh, then we, we came up uh, with, a, with a wearable device. What is the problem? Um, of course, uh, the four pillars of um, Om Karmic E Mala Rosary uh, are, as you can see in the slide, are um, the earlier slide, please. 
meditation spirituality yoga and nutrition are an alternative to medicine that's the that's the pillar uh uh how um, what we are it is it is a basically a variable device but before that i would like to discuss about uh, what we uh, we have been doing uh, so uh we have uh, a network of vendors around india nepal who are selling everything spiritual and yoga products and uh, that's how we have been surviving by selling those uh to the world and now we have come up with this uh how do you, sell it? You, do you sell it as an e-commerce site or do you sell it in brick and mortar um we sell it as an e-commerce site yes okay uh, and right how now, big is your uh, e-commerce business uh e-commerce uh, uh the, the revenue wise uh, around about 150000 uh, okay. dollars um okay. but recently we realized that we are face we were facing a lot of complaints from the customers so we thought that we will take up the the sales through our site only and not through the vendors so that is why on our site you don't see much of the the e-commerce happening right now uh, because uh, we are uh, uh, creating our own product line we have a product line so we are we are just uh, eliminating vendors right now want to sell ourselves so that we can handle the quality control ourselves you can understand if a vendor is sending something and the product uh, is because in our line of product the genuinity is very important so hence uh, we are taking it up ourselves um, in this journey we came up uh, with this um, rosary in fact we have come up with two wearable devices i will talk about the rosary first um what was the reason of uh, coming up with a um, e mala rosary first of all uh, um, as you can see that the pain was that uh, the world is going to um, innumerable diseases and uh, the kind of medicines being pumped i i know in us and india both uh, the 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 chronic diseases can be can be cured by all the indian uh, uh traditional i will not call it medicine because we are we are we are not uh, using any kind of medicine we are just using the yogas the pranamas um to cure you won't believe what kind of uh, uh chronic diseases we are talking about uh so what what the what does the wearable device do rajesh yeah so uh, the most important wearable device uh, what it does is first of all uh, it does all the normal things the gyros and the pedometers and all those wearables which most of on, uh, most of the wearables are doing what is new to us is the spo2 uh which is the the uh, oxygen blood oxygen saturation levels of the of the blood uh, that also helps uh, uh monitoring um uh, uh, some more uh, uh aspects so we we thought of this uh, product uh not uh, uh as a the not not yeah so uh, the rosary which we are planning uh, it checks the oxygen levels and as you can see right now when the covid situation came the the problem which happens with the patients initially is the blood oxygen levels go down in the in the patient whenever somebody contracts this virus uh and the doctors have been saying that whenever the patients are coming to us it is such a late uh it is in such a late situation that they they have to be put on ventilators but uh but during the early stages when the oxygen levels in their blood are going down they don't get to understand that this is happening to them so they and 
uh, even if you have a pulse oximeter uh, in a doctor's clinic, um, it is too late to understand that, oh, the blood oxygens have gone down. So, so what we are trying to do is uh, put a uh, variable on the, uh, on the person so that the so, blood oxygen levels can be monitored regularly. Uh, how how is how are you gonna get monitor a blood oxygen level uh, with with this? Is there a product that you've identified that you want to tie into yes. your rosary? Yes. Uh, it is a SpO2. Uh, the the technology is there uh, through the wrist only. Uh, the uh, the variable can uh, it is called a reflective uh, uh, technology. Um, so I have designed the product and we have a tech team working on it. Uh, we have already identified the SPO2 uh, sensor, which is going to be the part of Can our... Do you need any kind of FDA approval for this? Pardon? No, no, not yet. Not yet. Uh, but surely we are going to apply for that. Do you uh, need FDA approval? Yes, of course, we, we definitely need FDA approval if it has to go as a med medical device, right? Um, so what's your question? Pardon? What is your question? Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, we were till now, uh, uh, looking for a tech partner and, uh, and, and a CTO. Fortunately, uh, recently we have tied up with a, with a very, very uh, uh, respectable institute in India. It's called VNIT. And uh, they have come on board as uh, our uh, tech partners. So we are uh, uh, doing the research and development at the at this point in a place called Nagpur and this is the uh, somehow I can't send the message from here why do you want to send messages uh, that's okay do you have any questions regarding the the uh, rosary cinema I mean, I, the, the point of this session is for not for me to have questions, it's for you to have questions. This is a mentoring session, so where you need help, I'm here to help you. So, yes. um, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, the worry I have is that you don't have any experience in the medical device business, and you're trying to get into that business. I don't know what kind of team you have and whether you're going to be able to pull this off. It's, it's completely uncharted territory for, I mean, you're doing e-commerce in spiritual products that, are, that you're importing from India and Nepal, and, and to go from there to this oxygen monitor, e-rosary, uh, it's, it's a leap, so uh, I of would course. be careful. Of course, I, I totally understand. It is, it is a leap, and it is a, a big leap for us. Uh, Fortunately, we have uh, we have technical um, co-founders with us who have done it earlier. It is a it is a uh, an institute in India with whom we have tied up, and uh, the 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 whole institute has come. The head of the department, uh, Professor uh, K M Burchandi, he has come on board as CTO. He's a, a professor of electronics, head of the department, and they already have these modules. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have not uh, put together into a variable, but they are already working on it, uh, the, the different sensors which we are trying to put here into this, into the... Yeah, and you don't have any experience with all the FDA and all that stuff of medical devices in America, right? If you want to sell this in America, that's a uh, whole complex... You know, yes, I, I think we understand. We have been told by uh, because we are based out of Reno. We understand that uh, the FD approvals are very hard to get by. We are at the same time uh, in India. Um, IRD, I'm sure you must. In, there's a uh, very high interest from the insurance companies in the product because it keeps it gives them to monitor their uh, insureds. The biggest problem uh, right now is. Uh, for the insurance companies are the large claims 
So we have we are also right now tied up with a couple of insurance companies also who are looking um, at the product. And uh, uh, so uh, once we are definitely going to start from uh, India and then move over to uh, US. And of course, once right. yeah. okay, good luck. Thank you so much. So folks, um, if you like what we do here at One Million by One Million, and I think uh, in, the, in a couple of the presentations we uh, listened to today, there's some ambiguity on why we are here. This is a mentoring session. So it's not, not that I have questions about your business. I am trying to understand your business. That's the only way I can help you with your business. But you are going to need to come here with questions that you have in putting one foot before the other in building your business. So that's, um, you know, that's our structure here. And if you like that structure, I give very candid feedback. So um, if you like that structure, then you can refer other serious entrepreneurs to One Million by One Million. In terms of resources, everything is at 1mby1m.com. You will find a terrific blog that you can just follow the blog and learn a lot from. Um, in particular, I would point you to the Entrepreneur Journey series on the blog, which is basically all our one million by one million case studies available for free. If you are trying to learn entrepreneurship, and if you have time right now because of this lockdown, put aside maybe an hour a day to just go study case studies. Go to the One Million by One Million blog and study case studies, study the Entrepreneur Journeys interviews, and you will learn a lot. You will feel confident, you will feel inspired, you will learn methodology, you will feel you know, spiritually um, better, empowered, just by learning how other people did this journey from scratch. The Entrepreneur Journeys book series does the same thing. There are 12 volumes that's all available on, digitally on Amazon. You can go there as well. This one is actually organized topic by topic, so you can, if for, for example, if you're doing bootstrapping with a paycheck, you want to keep your job and you want to start bootstrapping a company, you can go look at that bootstrapping with a, check, a paycheck module a book, and, and that will give you insights into how to do that and so on and so forth. So uh, these roundtables happen every week. This is the 485th session. Um, our full acceleration program is 1M by 1M Premium. And there we offer you extensive methodology guidance on how to put one foot before the other. We have a full curriculum from which you can learn entrepreneurship. And uh, we help you with business development where we have contacts, we make connections. The strategy consulting happen in similar sessions to these that are private. We call them private roundtables. Um, and then we help you with financing. We have a terrific network of investors, hundreds of investors. You can go to the seed capital section of the blog and start reading investor interviews to get a feel for our investor community and how they are thinking about investment and so on. So that's, uh, you know, that's the full acceleration program. You could do the self-assessment on our blog. That's a free tool to help you understand where you are with your business. If you get stuck, you can do one by one in basic, which is our curriculum only option to plug your methodology gaps. Most first time entrepreneurs have a lot of methodology gaps. Um, so dig around on the website. Uh, the programs are all explained in deep detail. Uh, the curriculum is explained. There are lots of FAQs, video FAQs, et cetera. So, um, you know, decide whether this program is for you or not. We have a bootstrapping oriented methodology. We believe in bootstrap first, raise money later. It will be hard to raise money unless you can validate things first. And that's it. Uh, throughout May and June, we have roundtables every week. And the format usually is the same. We have an investor first, and then we have the entrepreneur pitches. So if you're looking for feedback, do register for one of the upcoming sessions. And um, uh, we also have online rendezvous, which is more a Q&A session. We collect all the questions we're getting from various different segments, uh, various different touch points, and then put together these sessions. They're live on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. They usually are at 8 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays. So that's also going to happen 
every uh, Tuesday in May and June. So I hope to see you in one of these sessions. We do have time for Q&A. Um, so the number, the calling number is up on your screen and uh, we are happy to take questions at this point. Uh, I just have one question, Sama. So, um, yeah. At what point uh, do you think uh, we should be uh, looking to raise some funds at uh, uh, prototype level when we have something to show, a work working prototype? Or, uh, Ajish, it's going to be very difficult for you to raise money unless you can show a team that has some experience of bringing a medical device to market. Okay. Uh, especially if you're trying to do that in the U.S. Um, so, you know, I think you can do whatever you want, but unless you can show a team that can bring this such a product to market and, and you can see some validation that there is demand for such a product, because you're competing with the big guys like Apple, right, who have the heart monitors and, and they're going to have all these other monitors. In there, you know, if you should go study Apple's product roadmap. So why do we need a product? Uh, why do we need an oxygen monitor in a rosary? I oxygen monitor is an oxygen monitor. There's no need to need for it to be a, in a rosary. It was it was, it was designed uh, to uh, to help patients with sleep. Yes, of course, we are we are comp going to be competing with the big guys, definitely, and we know that. Uh, that is why we are putting the team together. Definitely, yeah. we'll have. To. I, I would I would be very very uncomfortable sending a company to investors who claim to com compete with an Apple, for example. It's just not viable. The the level of resource they have is just not viable to compete with for a small startup. Okay. 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 Yes. So okay. I would be careful. I think you you know you have a business that works, um, a small business where you are actually doing business. And you're making this giant leap out of your, your you know, expertise zone into something that you don't know much about, really. Um, and I, I would be very, you know, very uncomfortable. The, the, the yoga part, the pranayam part, which, of course, the apples and the, they will, they will need some time to understand uh, where we are coming from, the spirituality side, the yoga side, the... That no, has nothing to do with an oxygen monitor. You do something in, if you're doing something in yoga and pranayam, that's different. That's not an oxygen monitor. Of course, the pranayam, whenever a person is doing a pranayam, the blood oxygen saturation levels go up. We need to measure that. Um, and that is where the SpO2 meter comes in. Uh, that is the reason we are. So reason we are you need to also, uh, Rajesh, the other thing that I would advise you to is to really uh, work on your pitch. The pitch doesn't work. Your pitch absolutely doesn't work. And, and you have all these slides full of... There from you, yes. <laughs> to understand how to create a uh, proper pitch on this uh, yeah. uh, product. You can't put that much text on, on a slide deck. That's just very bad practice. You know, there are lots of best practices on how to build a slide deck. I mean, forget about the content of your presentation, the flow, and the investor pitch, and all of that, but I mean, just from a pure aesthetics point of view, pure kind of um, optics point of view, you just cannot do that. That's just, just a complete no-no. Oh, yes, I can understand. Uh, everybody has been telling me to uh, upgrade the pitch. I will definitely try my best to do that. All right. So right, first, thanks. I'm going to introduce you to Irina Patterson. If you have questions about the 1M by 1M program, she will help you. She's on our team. Um, are there any other questions before we adjourn the session? All right. Looks like uh, we have covered everybody's questions. and. Uh, we're going to adjourn at this point. Uh, see you next week. Stay safe. Stay productive. Be well. And I will see you next time. Bye.